Good morning. I've really enjoyed being here on Long Island. You hear about New York. Long Island isn't New York. Long Island is kind of a paradise. And the boundary lines have fallen for you in pleasant places. And surely you have a delightful inheritance. And I've enjoyed my time with you this trip on Saturday morning. I was able to start with the men's breakfast. And very encouraging to see how you have mighty men in this church. Meditations on Proverbs and the way that wasn't just Pastor Totter's leading, but it was everybody's contributing. And it was just like uh, uh, ping pong balls going back and forth among the men. Iron sharpening iron. Very refreshing. And then the ladies had their conference. And you have women who fear the Lord among you in this place. And then for me to be able to spend the evening with your three pastors and to be able to see in particular in his domestic environment, uh, Pastor Dan Mercado. He is a fine young man. Where did you find that guy? Uh, I trust the Lord has said that I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And that, to me, seems like what you've got in Dan Mercado. And I praise the Lord for that. So now let's go to the Word of God one more time. And Hebrews chapter 12, we'll look at verses 1 and 2. The title of the sermon is, Running Until It Is Finished. We've heard somebody give that phrase, haven't we? It is finished. Romans 12, beginning at verse 1. <clears throat> Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we get an invitation into your house this morning, and we think of how on that first Lord's Day, the way that you merged with your disciples so that by the time you were done with them, their hearts burned within. And we pray that by your presence through the Spirit, we would have that same experience, that our hearts would burn within us and that you would fetch glory for yourself. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there's just something about an athletic foot race that sets ablaze a passion flame in the heart, an adrenaline rush in the soul. Even the first grader feels rage inside him or he or she as they crouch at the starting line waiting for the gun to go off at the elementary school field day 50-yard race. See, the runner of every shape and size and age feels it inside of him as he or she crouches. I think of a race that will take place just in about three weeks in Michigan. It's called the, the Riverbank Run in Grand Rapids. It's something that all of West Michigan participates in. It's a 25-kilometer run, a 15.5-mile run. At Harbor Church in Holland, we would sometimes have 20 or 30 people in our church running this race. It begins on a cool, crisp May morning in Grand Rapids there. And personally, I've run this race a number of times. Uh, uh, that internal rage inside 
at the starting line. And as one runs the race with passion, I have twice in running the race ended up at the Metropolitan Hospital Medical Tent because I basically passed out at the end. Even listen to this, once needing an IV. See, I'm not a very good runner. Uh, Cicero has said, he's the first century B.C. Roman philosopher. He, he knew that, that rage in running a race. He says, to be crowned at the Greek games brings no less honor than a public decree of the Senate. And the writer to Hebrews, he knew this rage of running and the passion as he wrote to the house church in Rome. And they had a flagging in their enthusiasm for following hard and running after the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice here how the writer to Hebrews enlists this imagery of a marathon run of the ancient Olympic-style games for the Christian's advantage. When he says here, look, therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race with endurance that is set before us. John Piper says this, the book of Hebrews was written to a church that was getting old and was settling into the world and was losing its wartime mentality and it was starting to drift through life without focus, without vigilance, without energy. You see, this church in the first century, their hands were growing weak and their knees were feeble. And, you know, for them, it just seemed easier to kind of meander in the crowd of life than to run hard the marathon of the Christian life. So we want to look at this passage, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. We want to unpack it under four main headings this morning. Four main headings. The first will be scan. That's in 1A. The second will be strip. That's in 1B. The third will be stride. That's in 1C. And the fourth will be stare. That's in 2. So come on with me. Look at this passage, four main headings. The first is scan. Scan. It says there, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Look at it, it starts there. Therefore, it's, it's harking back to the context, which is the 11th chapter, which is called the, the Hall of Faith, those heroes who ran their races. There's reference there to... Abel and Enoch and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Rahab and Gideon and Barak and Isaiah and Samuel and Joseph and, and David. This, this, this is the cloud of witnesses that is referring to. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, these, these martyrs even who've gone before us, these are noble legends who have valiantly fought to the death their own kingdom battles. They've, they've run to the finish their own spiritual races. They've earned the respect and the honor of our eyes. There were certain pressures, you see, in Rome, this church to which the writer of Hebrews is writing. There were difficulties that church was encountering. There were hardships that were strangling them and their faith, making them to feel like they just, just couldn't go on any further. If you were a Christian in the first century, you could be persecuted by the Nero political machine. People would be thrown into the Colosseum where there would be lions and you'd be sewn up into animal skins and torn apart. Who wants to keep running that race that might end you in that kind of a situation. Let's just quit the race. And so, even in the 21st century, we think of, oh, popular people who might, might just say, I want to quit the race. Like, oh, about 10 years ago, I remember Robert Williams, that actor, he committed suicide. He wrote, I just 
can't take it anymore. And in the Christian life, there may be certain circumstances where you feel like, I just, I, I, I can't go on. Like when your 22-year-old son comes to you and says, I'm gay, mom and dad. Or like when your spouse comes to you and says, I want a divorce. You talk about a gut punch. Or maybe if you're a pastor, someone comes and says, hey, pastor, my wife and my children, we're just going to leave the church. Or maybe a congregation or a leadership comes to a pastor and says, you know what, you, you keep preaching from the Bible and you're not sensitive to cultural issues and you're leaving the church. You're out of here. And as a Christian, you're running the Christian life and you say, with that kind of a gut punch, I just don't feel like I can keep going. I can't, I can't do this anymore. I just want to quit. Well, look what it says here regarding that kind of a spiritual marathon race that we're running. It says, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. You see, notice how he says, we have so great a cloud of witnesses. The writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, I'm right there with you. I find it difficult to keep putting one foot in front of the other in my race too. In 1212, he refers to those weak knees that we experience as spiritual runners, feeling temptation. We just want to turn aside. We just want to crumple up in a surrender heap in the middle of the infield as we're running our race. But it says, look, we have so great a cloud of witnesses. That word cloud is the Greek word nephos. It refers to a throng or a host of people surrounding us, encircling us, enveloping us. You see, these verbal strokes are sketching the imagery of really an ancient amphitheater where you see the ascending bleachers and, and grandstands and tiers. A few years ago, Diane and I were in Rome and we visited the Colosseum or the Circus Maximus. It's not quite as being at the big house in Ann Arbor, Michigan on a fall afternoon, but these are enormous stadiums. And on the infield of the stadium, on the track there, there may be an athletic event engaged below and there are people who are cheering on the athletes. And, and, and what's being viewed is here, not athletes so much, but there's, look, Abraham, and there's, there's David, and there's Gideon, and, and uh, they're looking down on those who are in the infield. I think even how it says in 13.7, it says, remember those who have gone before you and imitate their faith. Maybe it's a, it's a pastor who used to be at your church. Maybe he's died. Think of my dad who died in 2001. My dad, he was my hero in many ways. He's run his race. He's finished. He's done. That's what's in view here when one is running the race. Now, come on with me just to Grand Rapids and think of uh, in May there will be the running of this race. And if you're running the 15 and a half mile race in Grand Rapids, you start at the DeVos Center on Monroe and you run about six miles along the riverbank and it's basically downhill until you get to Johnson Park at the six mile mark. Then Johnson Park, you get a turn and start going up the river and you start getting into what's called the Butterworth Hills. The Butterworth Hills is a wasteland of gravel pits. There are people cheering at the DeVos Center when you started. Get to Johnson Park, there are families and your wife and your mom and your dad are there cheering. But you get out to the hills on Butterworth, there's nobody there. It's a desert. It's a wasteland. It's up and down on those hills. It's a grind. Nobody's cheering for you. The spectators are long gone, and you get this urge to quit. I just can't make it. I can't go. You think to yourself, but if I can just get to John Ball Park Zoo 
where there are thousands and thousands of people. At that point, you only got two more miles to go, and it's basically downhill. Because you see, at the John Ball Park Zoo, there are family and friends there and churchmen there. And they will give you the high five. They will reignite the embers. They'll drive the turbines. Spurgeon comments this way about this great call out of witnesses. He says, there's no excitement to run without onlookers. The spur to the racers is found in the eyes of the gazers. They're clapping hands. They're shouting applause. So in this scanning, it says, there's this great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Now, just a point of clarification here. Is it their influential gaze at us, my dad or the pastor or Moses, is it their gaze on us that motivates us? Sort of like, I remember there was a 25th anniversary of Le Miserable, and there was a performance commemorating the first performance, and one of the actors says, oh, I was performing Le Miserable, and because I knew that the original Jean Valjean was there, I performed in a very inspired way. Is that, is that what this is about Is it that the deceased saints are spectating and watching us? Well, that's really not the case that my dad or a pastor who's gone and died before us, though they're dead, they're not omniscient. They don't know everything. It does say in 1 Corinthians 4, 9, we apostles are spectacles to angels and men. Now, I do believe, in a sense, that there are angelic couriers that may tell my dad or, or your old pastor who's in heaven, it says, those souls, Revelation 6, under the throne say, how long, O Lord, sovereign and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. I think there's an awareness of those who have died have regarding what's happening on the earth, maybe like angels ascending and descending with messages back and forth from heaven to earth. There's an awareness, I think. But really this idea is that they are witnesses, Moses and the pastor and the father who've died. See, the emphasis is not so much on their seeing us, but I think the emphasis is on their telling us something as witnesses, because that's the word, witnesses, martyro. And we know that the testimony of two or three witnesses validates something. And so what their lives are testifying to us, the life of Abraham and Moses and David, they're saying, you can do it as we look at their lives. You can do it because I did it by grace. It says in Hebrews 11.4 that Abel, though dead, he yet speaks. So that's it. As we run our marathon of the Christian life in 2024, the patriarchs and the prophets and the apostles and our loved ones, again, we remember their faith and imitate their faith, they, they still speak. Even my dad my dad used to have certain sayings, and there was a woman just a couple, three years ago who wrote on my Facebook, as I, I said, I remember, my dad died in 2001, and she put in the comment section, she wrote, and she was going through cancer, chemo and cancer. She says, I still remember what your dad said to me two decades ago. Your dad said to me, growing old ain't for sissies. And how that speaks a message to her even in her chemotherapy marathon. And so we see here how Cole says this, knowing that the godly Jonathan Edwards, say, got voted out of his church in Northampton, and understanding the reasons why, because he was faithful. They didn't like him anymore in Northampton. Jonathan Edwards, and so too we can see a pastor who gets put out of his church can receive great encouragement in his spiritually battling in a difficult church ministry. Think of that woman on the floodplain in Scotland three centuries ago. 
as she was tied to a pylon. And the water of the tide kept coming up to her waist, to her shoulders, to her nostrils. Turn away from Christ. And she refused and she drowned and she died. She finished her marathon. And so in 2024, when I get my gut punches or I'm going under for the third time, I can continue on in this run to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. Piper says this. Piper in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where they have the Minneapolis Marathon that he no doubt maybe watched from his front porch there. Piper says this. These witnesses have run the race before us. They've gathered, as it were, along the marathon route to say, through the testimony of their lives, I finished, and so can you. They've gathered along the sidelines of our race, and they they hold out their wounds and joys, and they give us the best high fives we ever got. Go for it. You can do it. You can, by faith, finish it. It's like arriving at John Ball Park Zoo, and you're at the 13-mile marker, and you just can't keep going. But when you get that high five from that fellow churchman, I mean, imagine Bob Carson being there at the 13.5. Man, Bob, if you were there and you hammered my hand, I'd be like Luigi or Mario on Nintendo getting a mushroom. Expansion of my strength. And this is what our contemplations of these who went before us should affect us as we are to scan as we look at this passage. But secondly, having seen scan, come out with me to our second of our four main headings, strip. Strip. That's in 1B. Look what it says there. It says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, here's a strip part. Let us lay aside every encumbrance And the sin which so easily entangles us, that is, strip. What do we do with that adrenaline rush we get when we are in the race? What do we do when we get an inspiration surge? The urging advice when you get Pastor Bob or the old pastor who died, their witness to us With that adrenaline inspiration, we are to lay aside. Same word used in Acts 7.58 when it spoke of how those people who wanted to stone Stephen. In Acts 7, they, they laid aside their garments so they could throw stones unencumbered. It's referring to stripping off anything that impedes one's movement so as to accomplish maximum performance. Now, in the ancient Greek games, runners would strip down to the loincloth and even to less. Like, you know, modern athletes remove their warm-up pants and their sweatshirts. Some even take off their gold necklaces. Some will wear a, a sleeveless tank top, even in the cold. Some will even take off a a sweatband. Why? We don't want any wind resistance. Some will even shave like a swimmer. Don't want water resistance. I don't want the wind resisting my arm, the hair on my arm. I want to lay everything aside so I'll have the edge. Look, it says there, lay aside the sin which so eagerly entangles us, that, that distracts us from pursuing a goal. Ever seen on a fence in the summer how there's a, a fence post that you get an ivy vine encircling it, winding up it? You wouldn't want to be entangled by that if you were running, would you? No way, not at all. We want to be free to have this set aside. And so we think of a damaging fall, that that sin which so easily entangles. You see, what is the sin in view in the 12th of Hebrews? Well, maybe it's the doubting of God through unbelief that this church in Rome 
was experiencing. They would think to themselves, okay, I'm a father of five, and if I continue to follow after Christ and go instead of to the synagogue, which was really a politically protected religion, but I kept giving my affiliation to Jesus, which is an unprotected religion, they're taking down names, and I might end up dressed in an animal suit, staring down a lion. So maybe I'll go back to the synagogue, which is a safe place, and turn my back on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because what was happening here is they were diverting their eyes away from Christ as the high priest, and because of the difficulties, they were focusing not on the promises, but on the providences. They weren't focusing with faith but with fear. They weren't focusing on the certainty, but on the circumstances. And even probably there was a wider scope of personal battlefronts that were taking place. Because in 3.13 it says, Beware lest you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. See, there were a varied catalog of vices that they would fight against that would tangle them up and trip them up in their run to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. Like in 1216, it says, let none of you be like Esau who sold his soul for a bowl of salty stew. In other words, it was his sensual appetite, his hunger to be immediately gratified. That's what tripped up Esau. That's how he lost his inheritance and never got the prize. Even more particularly, it says, lay aside that besetting sin. That's what the KJV says. What much is referring to, besetting sin? Seems like it's referring to personal and chronic sin. That that sin which is the Achilles heel. For so we were at the men's breakfast yesterday. I know oftentimes at a men's breakfast, an Achilles heel may have to do with, with Purity, purity of mind. Maybe that's a besetting sin of yours that you need to deal with. I was once at a men's breakfast at our church, and the guy said, you know, Pastor Mark, on the way home he said, sometimes guys talk about purity, but for me, that's not really my besetting sin. That's not my main battlefront. And he went on to describe what his particular king's sin was. And so what's what's your king's sin? Or what's your queen sin? Could it be jealousy? Or dishonesty? In fact, I don't even really have to go further because you know exactly what it is right now. Covetousness, envy, judgmental criticism, laziness, lust, hatred, thanklessness, pride. Watson says... As there is a a queen bee to every hive, so there is one master sin to every soul. Spurgeon writes on besetting sins that we might overlook. He says, if there be but one crack in the lantern, referring to a lantern that will have like four glass plates, and then you got the flame on the inside. If there but be one crack in the lantern and the wind has found that little crack in like the little pebble hole where the wind can get in, the wind has found it and blows out the candle. Oh, how great a mischief is one unguarded point of character that may cause the pilot light of our souls to go out. So we're no longer burning hot for the Lord Jesus Christ, but we're now lukewarm, in danger of being, Revelation 3, spit out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus like the church in Laodicea. Maybe the issue for you is that you are battling with this known sin, but you're not dealing with it. It says here, look, lay aside every encumbrance then. It's interesting, the word encumbrance is not the same word as sin. The word is agkos, encumbrance, which means weight. This seems to be referring to something that in and of itself is not necessarily sinful or bad. Ken Hughes says this, this is referring to something that could be good, 
but weighs you down spiritually. There's a guy named Louis Zamperini. You ever see that movie Unbroken? And Zamp, he ran the five kilometer. In fact, he left. It was about 1940-ish. And he, he left New York Harbor. And he was heading for Berlin. He had 10 days on the boat. And there was a lot of food on that boat. And a 5K runner is usually sleek. But by the time he arrived there with all that food in Berlin, he was like the Pillsbury Doughboy. He put on 10 additional pounds and he ran really poorly. And so that's what's in view. He had, he had sabotaged himself from getting the medal in the 5K. It says, lay aside every weight, every encumbrance, something that it may be innocent and harmless in itself, but, but personally, it weighs me down. It diverts my attention. It, it, it saps my energy. It dampens my enthusiasm for the things of God. It says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, run the race in such a way that you, what? Finish at the back of the pack? No, no, no. Run in such a way that you win the prize. So we should all search our hearts to know, is there something that hinders, that slows me down from being a productive steward? Now you may be sitting there right now. There's a wrestling match going on in your own soul concerning that thing, <laughs> that encumbrance. You may say, well, what's wrong with it? Okay, I understand what you're saying. What's wrong with it? But the issue of passing inspection, it's not that it fundamentally is sin. Like there was a time when I was really preparing this message for the first time, and I was sitting at my dining room table. I usually study in the basement. But Sunday mornings I study upstairs near the kitchen, looking out the back slider into our big backyard. And then Diane gets up, and she sometimes will massage my back, and that's the best. But this morning, she had our little grandson, Richard, about two and a half, three years old, and Richard was sitting on the counter, and Diane was making pancakes with blueberries and the dough and the toast, and I was just mesmerized by that little boy sitting there and playing with blueberries. There was nothing sinful about that, but it was distracting me from focusing on my sermon. I had to get my Bible and my notes and get to another room because it was slowing me down in my stewardship. Kent Hughes says this, it could be for you a friendship or an association or an event or a place or a habit or a pleasure or an entertainment or an honor. If it drags you down, strip it away. It may be really harmless. I don't know, maybe you're, maybe you're a hunter. And maybe for you, I don't know if you can hunt on Long Island, but maybe it's a blind off in a forest somewhere that you've got to tear down. Like Bob, you were, Bob and I were talking about, <coughs> we played golf yesterday. And I said, I didn't play golf when I was uh, late 20s until about 40 because I had children. The, the golf course wouldn't have been sinful for me, but... Being a father of five, it wasn't time to be hitting a white ball. It was time to be with my wife and, and raise. I'm not saying you can't golf in your 20s and 30s, guys. But I'm saying, what about these issues that we can lay aside? I still remember uh, Jeff Smith from Coconut Creek and I were talking about this idea of an encumbrance. And we said, well, he, he said, you know, there was a girl that in college, she wore a certain kind of a perfume. Let's say it's Sierra perfume. And he said, then my wife, about 15 years later, she started wearing Sierra perfume. And I, I had to say, honey, there's nothing wrong with Sierra. But don't wear that anymore. Because it was an encumbrance to him. We should look at our lives and, and lay aside something that even may, may be painful that you've got to lay aside. There was a guy, he was named uh, W. Kimball. And he was an uh, animator for the Snow White film. And they put together, took him 250 days to prepare a four and a half minute cartoon animation of Snow White in the kitchen working with the dwarves making a dinner. And it was magnificent. But Walt Disney looked at it and he says, 
You know, it's really magnificent. But the whole four and a half minute got cut and thrown on the cutting room floor because it says it hindered the flow. Oh, painful. And so I wonder for us, when the, the great premiere of the life of, of Bob Carson plays on Judgment Day, or Doug Totter or Mark Chansky on Judgment Day, what is it that really should be cut? Because it, not sinful in itself, but it harms the flow of our lives. We should ask, lay it aside, that, that which can trip up in the race. Maybe it's the Yankees. And Bob was even telling me yesterday how he used to be a, a hot dog salesman at the stadium. But then when the Jets had Joe Namath, he was mesmerized by Joe on the infield. He lost his job because he didn't sell enough dogs. And so for us, what, what is it that can mesmerize us? F.B. Meyer says this, we can't judge each other what's a weight to one isn't a weight to all. But the Holy Spirit, if asked, he will reveal a general feeling of discouragement is probably the work of the enemy. But if you're aware of some speed-hindering encumbrance, it's almost certainly the work of the Holy Spirit. Is there anything in your life that, that saps your energy from holy things, that disinclines you from Bible study or produces in you a disturbing uneasiness regarding a thing you previously saw as harmless, but now you see it as harmful? Well, that's a weight that should be set aside. So, so we've seen scan, strip. Now quickly, thirdly, come with me, consider with me stride. Stride, that's 11C. And let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. The word run is the Greek word treko, which refers to fast-paced foot travel. Same word was used for the prodigal's father who didn't meander toward him, he ran toward his son when he saw him. Or in John 20, John and Peter were huffing and puffing. They ran to get to the tomb. Not walking, not dawdling, striding out. Run the race, it says. That word race is agon. What word does that refer to? Agony. In fact, the marathon was called the agon in the Greek. The agony. Why is it called the agony? It's the race that keeps on giving more pain. Stride after stride. Pain. Run the race. I feel like I can't do it anymore. Keep running the race. It's not a short sprint, this Christian life. The prize isn't for the rabbits. I've been to a high school track meet. You have to have four from each school in each event. And when it came to the, the 3,200 meters, only had three guys to run. So the coach brought a sprinter in to be the fourth. And the sprinter started the two-mile run. And after one lap, he's in the lead. And he thinks to himself, this is a piece of cake. I'll get the blue ribbon for sure. But by the third lap, he collapsed on the infield. Because you got to finish the race. you got to continue the race. The prize isn't for the rabbits. We can't be like the seed that is sown on the rocky soil that sprouts up with joy, but then it withers away. No, run the race set before us, it says. That means the prescribed path. We can't just have a zeal without knowledge. I have seen in cross-country meets where a runner will, he'll miss a chalk line or he'll miss a cone and cut a corner and he finishes the race and he thought he won it. But they said, I'm sorry, you missed a cone over there a mile back. What, what? Lord, Lord, did we not perform miracles in your name? Lord, Lord, did we not Cast out demons in your name. Depart from me, I never knew you. Run the race that is set before you. The broad road leads to destruction. The narrow road leads to eternal life. Run the narrow road. Run the race set before you. See, some people don't quit altogether, but they're deceived by an easy believism. And it says run with endurance. 
endurance, run with staying power, never, never, never give up. I still remember in the year 2000, I ran the Riverbank Run, 25 kilometers. And this was the year I was going to get my personal record, PR, I thought, under two hours. And I was having devotions with our family, and our little six-year-old Nathan was sitting there next to Diane on the sofa. And I said, Nathan, it says you're to run the race in such a way as to win the prize. And you watch your dad run tomorrow. And I'm going to run with everything that is in me. And so I went out and ran. And I was running pretty good. But when I came for the last two miles, the wind was against me. And it was an ugly wind. And I kept running and running, and I probably should have stopped because I was ashen white. But my fear was, Nathan is going to see me standing next to Diane holding her hand at that curbside. And I said, I can't, I can't let Nathan see Dad stopping and walking. i got to keep running. And when I finally crossed the finish line half dead, people with white coats received me. And took me and gave me an IV and gave me oxygen. But that's the issue that's at stake. We need to run with endurance. Piper says this, don't take your eternal security for granted. This is the point of the whole book. All those warning sections, those warning sections in the book, which says, do not quit lest you be those who are like the seed sown on the bad Soil. Piper says this, don't take your eternal security for granted. This is the point of the whole book. Endure, persevere, run, fight, be alert, be strengthened, don't drift, don't neglect or be sluggish, don't coast, run, don't stroll, meander, or wander, run to finish the race as if everything hung on your finishing. And this leads us forth and then finally to having seen scan, strip, and stride. Lastly, stare. Stare, that's in verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Stare. This is so crucial. It's not just our running because our finishing depends wholly on us. It says, steer, fix your eyes on Jesus. When we're fainting in our race, yeah, our cloud of witnesses spurs us on, but it's our great high priest, the Lord Jesus, who obsesses us. He's to fill our eyes. Ladies, you ever have a baby? And you realize, i got to keep on. And sometimes if it's a second child, there will be this focal point picture of the first child. And the mom looks at that first child and says, if I keep pushing, if I keep pushing, it's obsessed with that picture of the first because I get a second one. If I keep pushing. The Christian's focal point is the Lord Jesus Christ. We may stare at our spiritual heroes or glance at them, but we stare at our Savior. Jonathan Edwards says, feast your eyes on Christ's excellence because he endured the cross. His race was a true agony, wasn't it? The marathon run, when he was scourged, when he carried the cross beam, when he was pierced in hands and feet, when he hung, when he was abandoned by the Father. This was his agony. This was his marathon. Did he quit? No, no. He ran until it was finished. He ran for the, for the joy that was set before him. He ran With the idea in mind, a mother may run and say, I'm going to get another one of those little children for my arms. But the Lord Jesus, you know who he had in his mind when he was running? He had a picture of you, his elect. Hebrews 2, Jesus says after his race, here I am. 
and the children thou hast given me. See, you are a darling in his eyes. And he ran and he pushed and he endured the agony until it was finished for the likes of you. You were redeemed by his work. The the, the conviction of things not seen. The Lord Jesus knew that the Father had promised to him a bride, his church, who would be his. And look, it says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Jesus is the author, which means he is the starter of our faith, the perfecter. He is the finisher of our faith. You have a baptismal back here? When when we baptize people, the typical saying I have when one of our teenagers maybe comes up, uh, I think when Naomi came up, I said, Naomi, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus began it. Jesus will complete it. Philippians 2, I say to Naomi, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You need to do it. But it is God who works in you to will and act according to his good pleasure. Jesus is the author, the starter, and the perfecter of our faith. You ever hear of a guy named Rick and Dick Hoyt? Rick Hoyt was a cerebral palsy person who shook and was all contorted. And he was born as a little baby, and uh, Dick saw his little child and always pitied him. But the doctor said, you should put him away in some geriatric facility somewhere and, and uh, put him on a shelf. But Dick said, oh, no, no, this is my boy. I'm going to take care of my boy. And when he was about 17 years old, uh, Rick was able to punch things out with his contorted fingers with a computer. And he once punched out, he says, Dad... There is a disability 5K run. Maybe we could run that. And Dick said, oh, he wants to run a 5K. So he made a stroller, and he he ran with Rick. Dick ran with Rick in the stroller. And at the end of that race, he pecked out, Dad, when I run, I feel like my disability disappears. And Dick thought, oh, this exhilarates my son. So Dick said, we're going to do this a lot. He ended up running 157 Ironman runs, which is those triathlons. And then he ran something like 27 Boston marathons, pushing little Rick, who didn't get so, he was big eventually, kept pushing him. So, So that when you go and start at the Boston Marathon, there's a bronze statue of Dick And Rick Hoyt, in fact, they died about three years ago. First, Dick died, and two years later, Rick died. But there's an interesting video on YouTube. It's called, I Can Only Imagine. You ever see this? It's it's this song, I Can Only Imagine, what it will be like when I see Jesus face to face. And it's this video of Dick Hoyt. Well, you actually see a video of Rick Hoyt in a little raft contorted, laying in the raft, but the camera pans out, and you see that Dick is in the water, and he's digging in the water, pulling, pulling, pulling for that maybe half a mile swim, and then Dick gets, pulls him out, puts him on a bike, and they ride for miles up and down hills in desert, and then he, he gets off, and he puts him in a stroller, and then he, he pushes him. In fact, there's a, at the end of the video, You can see they're finishing off a Boston Marathon, and it's late at night because everybody else is finished. And here comes Rick and Dick. And you can see Rick is all contorted, but he's cheering and he's screaming. He's got endorphins because he's finishing, and there are thousands of people still waiting to see this father-son team end. And everybody cheers and cheers, and there's Rick and Rick realizes he's finished it all, and he feels like he doesn't have a disability. He feels like he's got wings, but he turns around, and who does he see? He sees his dad, who did everything. His dad was the author and the perfecter of his race. And that's us. When we finish, 
with a great crowd of witnesses cheering us on, your old pastor, your dad, your mom, Moses, and Elijah, and we're exhilarated with, we, we entered the east gate of the celestial city. We will turn and look at the author and the perfecter of our faith who endured his race, and he hung on that cross until it was finished for us. And we will sing forever, worthy is the Lamb who is to be praised, to have glory and honor and praise. So, brothers and sisters, you, you say, I can't keep doing this. I feel like Robin Williams. I can't go on anymore. Oh, yes, you can. Finish the race set before us, obsessing and focusing in on the author and perfecter of our faith, the Lord Jesus. And by his grace and by his mercy, may we all be there on the last day and finish it. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this passage we thank you for the invitation to your house. I don't even know these people here and what's going on in their lives, but you do. And may this be a word in season. And even for the soul who's here apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, would you please cause this soul, these souls to look on the Lord Jesus, whether it be the first time or the 10,000th and first time, me, all of us. And may we fix our eyes on Jesus and believe. We ask this in his name. Amen.